So the first official console Pokemon game, Sword and Shield, are coming out very soon. And so to celebrate, today you guys are going to witness me become the first black Pokemon professor. Wait, is Kukui black? He does kind of dress like a light-skinned dude, don't he? But the goal of this episode is to analyze the chemistry and biochemistry in a handful of Pokedex entries, and then decide if any of these Pokemon could actually exist in real life. But because there are so many Pokemon, today we're going to do what Game Freak always does and just focus on Gen 1. So if you guys are interested in seeing more of this content, let me know in the comments below and then we can explore the subsequent generations in future videos. I'll pin the timestamps for each Pokemon we'll talk about in this video in the comments. And so if you get bored or impatient, feel free to jump around. Finally, if you're new here, my name is Tyson. I'm a fourth year PhD student in chemistry at Yale University and I make cool unorthodox chemistry videos like this. And so if you enjoy the content today, it would help me out a lot if you subscribe to the channel and become part of the team. All right, let's get to work. All right, so starting right off with Bulbasaur, number one, the first Pokemon in the national decks, which unfortunately no longer exists. Uh, so Bulbasaur can be seen napping in bright sunlight. There is a seed on its back. By soaking up the sun's rays, the seed grows progressively. All right, so basically it's just a plant. A quick correction though would be that the, the sun's light can't actually cause the seed to grow. But that's a common misconception. The sun's light will give the Pokemon the energy that it needs to grow, but in order to grow, you need to add mass, which means that you're gonna need a source of matter. And so the most likely thing is that the light will power the conversion of carbon dioxide and water to glucose and oxygen, a process that we know as photosynthesis. And then that glucose can be incorporated in the cellulose and other biomolecules that will ultimately contribute to the growth of Bulbasaur and to its seed. All right, Charizard. So it is said that Charizard's flame burns hotter if it has experienced harsh battles. Sure. All right, so I want to comment on something that's actually less about this Pokedex entry and more about the biochemistry of this Pokemon in general. All right, so this is a fantastic design. Everyone loves Charizard, but realistically, having a tail that is consistently on fire is an absurd disadvantage from an evolutionary perspective. It's something that would likely never be selected for because there's no clear advantage to it, but it requires a tremendous amount of energy in order to fuel. So this Pokemon would likely have to eat non-stop just so that he can make his tail look cool. Uh, not super viable, I would say. All right, next up, Squirtle. So, he shoots water at prey while in the water, withdraws into shells when in danger. So some serious uh, sentence fragments here. Uh, okay, so this Pokemon shoots water and water is H2O. There you go, science. Atkins, by dislocating its jaw, it can swallow prey larger than itself. After a meal, it curls up and rests. Damn, not much to say here. That's dedication, bro. You deserve that meal. Nothing can avoid falling asleep hearing a Jigglypuff song. The sound waves of its singing voice match the brain waves of someone in a deep sleep. All right, and so this is one that we've all seen in the anime if you've watched Pokemon as a kid. There's a reasonably well-cited study from a couple of years ago now that supports the increase in the quality of sleep of older adults when listening to calm, you know, slow music like Jigglypuff's song. But I don't think there's any evidence for the music straight up making people narcoleptic like we see in the anime. An alternative explanation could be that Jigglypuff's song somehow induces the listener to produce and secrete a large amount of melatonin, which is one of the primary hormones involved in regulating our sleep-wake cycle cycles and they're making us feel sleepy. <sighs> Pikachu. This forest dwelling Pokemon stores electricity in its cheeks so you'll feel a tingly shock if you touch it. All right and so everyone's favorite little guy right? The mascot of the series and an S tier Smash Ultimate Fighter. I interpret this basically as a form of energy storage right and so basically you use excess energy in order to perform a task that you can reverse later on in order to get that energy back out. Presumably Pikachu like most other organisms creates high energy compounds like ATP after he eats but Pikachu would have to have some kind of biochemical mechanism in place that would allow him to convert that chemical energy into electricity. Much like Charizard though, he would have to account for this energy loss because this would be energy that's intended to fuel his body that's instead being used for some alternative, arguably pointless task. Okay, Polyrath. Its percentage of body fat is nearly zero. Whoa. Its body is entirely muscle, which makes it heavy and forces its swimming prowess to develop. So this is nonsense. This Pokemon doesn't even look like it lifts. Nonetheless, a body fat percentage this low would hardly be able to support life. After you eat, your body stores excess energy by synthesizing fatty acids and other biomolecules that it can store 
and then break down later on. That way you can still continue to exist in the fasted state, i.e. when you're not eating. Having no fat would mean that this Pokemon would basically just die if it went a couple hours without a meal. But this is assuming that Polyrath's biochemistry is similar to ours, because I don't know anything about frog science or whatever Polyrath is. Alright, my man Young Chop on the beat. His whole body is covered in muscle, so it can raise bulge. Whoa! Anyway, it can throw a hundred adults, bro. This whole Pokedex entry is out of control. What's going on here? Next, all right, Graveler. Rocks are Graveler's favorite food. This Pokemon will climb a mountain summit, crunching feastily on rocks all the while. Upon reaching the peak, it rolls back down to the bottom. All right, so this concept of eating non-organic matter is very common in games, cartoons, etc., but it's really not functional. Eating rocks is not useful. So as I've mentioned a few times now, organisms eat because food serves as fuel that we can burn in order to get the energy that we need to do stuff. In order for Graveler to sustain itself on rocks alone, it would need some kind of biochemical mechanism in place that allows it to gain chemical energy from these rocks. Most organisms take their food and oxidize it into carbon dioxide and water, which is why we all need oxygen in order to live. <sighs> I had to lose a jacket real quick, it's too hot in here. Whew. By the way, if you're enjoying the video so far, I would really appreciate if you smash that like button real quick. Appreciate it. All right, Alone Muck. The garbage it eats causes continuous chemical changes in the body, which produces this exceedingly vivid coloration. All right, I like this one because it actually has the word chemical in it. This is presumably achievable. Most pigments, the molecules that typically cause coloration of substances, are organic or carbon-containing molecules with very extensive and conjugated pi systems, basically meaning that electrons travel freely throughout the molecule. These types of systems absorb and reflect different frequencies of light, causing things to appear colored. For example, most plants are green because they contain a pigment called chlorophyll that absorbs red light and reflects green light. And so hypothetically speaking, a lonely muck's body could synthesize a variety of different pigments and then store them in different areas in order to create the pattern that we see here. Alright, Krabby. Krabby lives on beaches burrowed inside holes dug into the sand. On sandy beaches with little in the way of food, these Pokemon can be seen squabbling with each other over territory. Okay, so this is literally just a crab. That's it. Lickitung. It checks out whatever's around by licking everything. If you don't clean off a spot where it's licked you, you'll break out in a rash. Ew, this one's just nasty. Like, why would anyone like this Pokemon? Eevee has an unstable genetic makeup that suddenly mutates due to the environment in which it lives. Radiation from various stones causes this Pokemon to evolve. Alright, and so this is not really how mutation and evolution work in real life. Unfortunately, as written, this is much more likely to lead to something like cancer than to an evolution. In general, individuals don't evolve, species evolve. If you place an Eevee in a hot environment, even if a fire zone is there, it's not going to evolve into a Flareon. At least not via the mechanism described here. Here's a quick and cursory explanation as to how this would more likely work in real life. If you had a small subset of EVs in a population that were born with a particular mutation that causes a very important enzyme to work better at a higher temperature, these EVs would be at an evolutionary advantage in this hot environment, meaning that they would be more likely to reproduce and pass their genes on to their offspring. Eventually, a very large portion of this Eevee population would have this particular mutation, and so on and so forth, new sets of gene variations could appear in that environment that would be selected for. Eventually, all the Eevees in this area are no longer similar to the Eevees that had originally migrated there. Now, all the Eevees that were there have evolved into Flareon. Boom, evolution. And again, even this is very hand wavy, but I would argue that it's more accurate than what's written in this Pokedex entry. Alright, Vaporeon. Its cell structure is similar to water molecules. All right, it's already trash. It will melt away and become invisible in water. All right, so this literally makes no sense. And so cells are comprised primarily of water. The molecules come together in order to form cells. A cell is, on a very chemical level, a bunch of molecules that work together in a very incredible and efficient way. So you can't really have a cell that's similar in structure to a water molecule. This would be like saying that a house has a structure similar to a 2x4 or similar to a brick. It just doesn't really make sense. Alright, next up is Flareon. Flareon's fluffy fur has a functional purpose. It releases heat into the air so that its body does not get excessively hot. This Pokemon's body temperature can rise to a maximum of 1650 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. All right, so this is absurdly hot. All right, and so water evaporates at about 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this Pokemon would have no liquid water inside or around it, meaning that his organs would be completely shriveled and dysfunctional. All of the chemistry that is required to sustain life occurs in aqueous solution. 
meaning that these molecules need to be dissolved in water in order to function the way that they do to keep you alive. And so this is why when scientists are searching for life on other planets, they typically start by searching for liquid water. This is also why no one is really searching for life on Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, which gets as hot as about 800 degrees Fahrenheit during its day cycle. So yeah, not only can this Pokemon in no way be alive, coming within probably even several yards of this thing would just roast you immediately. Porygon. Using the most advanced technologies, scientists finally succeeded in making the first artificial Pokemon. Pretty dope. I'm currently recruiting any scientist that would be willing to work with me in order to create a Porygon in real life. Just hopefully one with better stats. Articuno, a legendary bird Pokemon. It freezes water that is contained in winter air and makes it snow. All right, so it's not very impressive to freeze water in the winter. If you wanna impress me Articuno, freeze some water in July. All right, Dragonite, the pseudo legendary. It flies over raging seas as if they were nothing. Observing this, a ship's captain dubbed this Pokemon the Sea Incarnate. <laughs> Alright, this is pretty gangster because like, this Pokemon is hella fat. They didn't even bother to make him aerodynamic. They were like, nah, we're going to put these little behind wings on this fat dragon and call it a day. <laughs> Cool, cool. All right, Mewtwo. Mewtwo is a Pokemon that was created by genetic manipulation. However, even though the scientific power of humans created this Pokemon's body, they failed to endow Mewtwo with a compassionate heart. First things first, compassion, overrated. This doesn't really mean too much because genetic manipulation is sufficiently vague that it can't be wrong. But either way, change of plans. Scratch Porygon, I'm recruiting anyone who's interested in making a Mewtwo because Mewtwo is way cooler. Mew. Its DNA is said to contain the genetic code of all Pokemon, so it can use all kinds of techniques. All organisms have the same genetic code. I contain the genetic code of all organisms as well. This is the mechanism by which the genetic information within the cell is read and processed in order to sustain life. It's the same for all organisms, and it's referred to as the central dogma of molecular biology. And so DNA is transcribed into what's known as messenger RNA within the nucleus, which is then translated by ribosomes in the cytosol in order to create proteins. And so the proteins that each of us synthesize are really what make us who we are. Everyone knows about DNA, but really and truly, DNA is not a very functional molecule. It's just a book that the cell reads in order to tell it which proteins it should make. Whew. All right, and so that's it for Gen 1. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that and hopefully you learned something new as well. And so if you enjoyed this video, definitely make sure to hit that like button. And there are two things I wanna hear from you guys in the comments below. One, let me know if there are any Pokemon from Gen 1 that you wish I would've covered in this video. Two, let me know if you guys would be interested in seeing me do the other generations in the future. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys next time. I said, I don't go to jail. I go to Yale. Multiple degrees, what that mean? Woman's hell. Young black king, I'm about that thing like Lauren Hill. Yo, the swag is Will Smith, my resume like Uncle Phil, no. My style is polished, I'm fly as a pilot. I'm fresh, man, like the first year I was in college.